Flood Brothers Podcast, a Five Pillars of Mad Monarch production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there. And welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Dili Hussain. Uh, unfortunately, my co host and my blood brother, Aki, will not be joining us in this episode, and maybe some future episodes due to some work commitments, he will be missed. I never envisaged 10 years ago that the person that we've got on today would I would regard as someone as a personal friend, a brother and a teacher in many facets of the Dawah and activism. Um, I'm not going to throw any more dirt on the brother's face. Uh, it is a former Guantanamo Bay detainee and the outreach director of advocacy group Cage Mwazambeg. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam alaikum 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 I'm honoured to have you here. The honour is mine. Zakhluk Now, when I got in touch with you about the podcast, we already set out some conversation points, uh, which five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, I said to you, I'm going to scrap entirely, right? And you are okay with that? Absolutely. But I want to kick off today's podcast by asking you or mentioning ten things, one word, and I want you to just spend some time telling me your immediate thoughts when I mention the following words. Can I proceed? Go ahead. Links gang. Racism. Birmingham. Home. Bosnia. Jihad. Chechnya. Jihad. Taliban. Honor. Guantanamo. Dishonor. Malcolm X. Hero. Erdogan. Jury's out. Khabib Nurmagomedov. MMA fighter. And the last word, which will be the crux of today's podcast, Syria. Mercy. Today's podcast will be about Syria. And I'll tell you why that is. I know it's, it's a topic, it's a, it's a conflict, which is at the heart of, I'm very close to both of us. Um, we even nearly started a mini podcast before the cameras came on. But before we do start talking about Syria, I need to ask this question. Do you ever get bored or frustrated with continuously talking about your experience in Guantanamo? In an answer, a single word answer, yes. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. But can I just tell you that when I've shared panels with you multiple times, that I never get bored of hearing about it. Mm, well, maybe you've not heard enough. <laughs> and, and I asked Sister Yvonne the same question about her, you know, from, from captivity to Islam, right? I was like, do you ever get bored of narrating the same story or different aspects of the story and kind of like creatively delivering certain aspects? And she's like, yes, but at the same time, it needs to be said. Do you still, feel, is that the same with you? You still feel an importance to get the um, story across? You know, I say about Guantanamo, it was just three years of my life. I'm 51 years old now, so it was only three years of you my life. You don't look it, mashallah. And alhamdulillah, but there's so much more to talk about. You spoke about Bosnia, we're going to be speaking about Syria, hmm. and of course what's happening in the UK. So there are various aspects to what I've experienced and seen and witnessed that I think are important. Guantanamo is just one of them. It's still open, still 40 brothers there. And we're still fighting for it to be closed, or at least for the brothers there to be repatriated. Um, and it's a visible uh, depiction, as it were, Guantanamo, of, of what, all that's terrible, all that's wrong in the war on terror. But that war on terror now has been lasting now for almost two decades and has spread across the world and mm. affects Muslims primarily. Mm. With regards to the Syrian conflict, I want to work today backwards, right? Uh, so as opposed to from 2011 onwards, I want to work backwards with current events and, and, and kind of trying to break down how we got to the situation where we are. And most importantly is how it's affecting Muslims in the West. So recently, at the time of the filming of this podcast, we've had uh, the killing of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of the criminal organization ISIS, for the fifth or sixth time. But let's just take for an assumption, or let's take... That he has actually been killed. We've had uh, Turkey recently going into the Kurdish areas in north of Syria. I believe there's been a ceasefire, or and, and Turkey has uh, has either uh, seized military operations. Where at the time of the shooting of this podcast, Idlib remains, or, or, or parts of Idlib remains, the last standing liberated area of Syria, amongst other pockets in the, in the suburbs. How? We've seen so many different powers involved in Syria. 
is there a right side to take Muslim? Is, is, is there a side that Muslims, practicing Sunni Muslims, with a conscience, God-fearing, is there a right side to be on in Syria? Um, well, let, let's just go back. Um, the Prophet ﷺ said in a famous hadith, he said that, If the people of Syria uh, become corrupted, then there is no good left. And he's talking to the Sahaba in you. Uh, so long as long as there are good people in Syria, there will be good in us as an ummah. So it's a, it, Syria is a place that we look at as a benchmark for the rest of the Muslim ummah. As long as there's resistance, as long as there's deen, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah mubarak lana fi shamina. Oh Allah, bless us in our sham, uh, our land of, of Syria. So let's let's look at it from that lens. And let's also look at it from the lens of this is a blessed land. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what dini was zaytun, he's talking about this land. When he's giving, giving um, talking about the land of the fig tree and the olive tree. When I used to live in Syria in 2012, 13, I lived on, on land that was owned by a, a, a brother, an elderly brother, who had been imprisoned by uh, Hafiz al-Assad in the 70s, in the 80s during the Hama uprising of the Ikhwan al muslims yes. And they were brutally massacred. At least 10,000 killed. At least, At least, yeah. So he was taken to a prison in the east that is still operative now by the government, and it's called Sijin al-Tadmur, which is Tadmur prison. And he was uh, tortured there to the point at which he was blinded. But the really fascinating part of his story, he told me, is that because he was a teacher of Islam and, and Quran in particular, his students loved him. There were about 50 or 60 students, uh, uh, prisoners in each cell. So they couldn't keep a track out of the hundreds and thousands they had. And when his number came up for execution, he was uh, slated to be executed. Somebody went in his place and was killed in his place. And he, res he lived as a result of that. After 18 years, he was released. When the people eventually came out, after the um, the Syrian, the Arab Spring, or Rabi al-Arabi, mm. as it's called. In Syria, it was slightly different to where it was, how it was in Tunisia or, or in um, uh, Libya or even in Egypt. And people came out and said, that people want to bring, to bring down the, the, the government. The government itself had already been involved in the brutal repression of, of uh, Muslims. Mm. And... One of the things, it's really important that your, your, your listeners understand this, that when they say Bashar al-Assad is this bastion of anti-imperialism, he supported Hamas, <laughs> and you know, they've, they've been uh, at least threatening to take back the Golan Heights yeah, yeah. for the past 30 or 40 yeah. years. The truth is this, when I was held by the Americans, they said, if you don't cooperate, we're going to send you to Syria. Hmm. Now, why would the American CIA threaten to send me to Syria? And then I found out they had actually sent people to Syria. And I'll name some of the names who they sent. Mar Arar, um, Abdul al-Maliki, Mu'ayyid Nuruddin, and Ahmed Abu al-Mu'ati. These are four Syrian, uh, Canadian Syrians who were handed over uh, either with uh, Canadian complicity and American pl complicity to the Syrian regime under Bashar al-Assad following the war on terror. And all were tortured, uh, sometimes put in a coffin, while they're alive, beaten on the soles of their feet with cables and put in the famous, infamous uh, prison, Farah Palestine, Palestine branch in Damascus, where people were tortured. When these people eventually were released, they, they, they fought a case against the, the Canadian government for being involved in the uh, torture and received an apology from just, Justin Trudeau mm. and millions of dollars in compensation. So here is now the great anti-imperialist working alongside... The imperialists. Uh, the imperialists, of yeah. course and working with them in the war on terror. Mm. And of course, he uses the language of the war on terror, the language his father used to brutally repress Ikhwan al-Muslimin and put people en masse in the prisons of Tadmor and others. And here was Abu Ahmed, or this brother I was telling you about, mm. the uncle, um, who said, now on my land, uh, where I grow these olive trees, I am proud to have my sons and nephews and so forth in my little village standing up against the very regime that tortured us. And we will fight till the end. And they still are fighting. So, okay, okay. But how would we, and I say we, I include both of us in this, but I'm probing you today. We've been somewhat outspoken on the Syrian conflict, right? I know that both you and I, amongst others, but, you know, we refrain from using terms like civil war because civil war essentially legitimizes the Assad regime, right? Because what's happening in Syria is not a civil war at all, by any means. Uh, what's kept the Assad regime alive are the Russians from the sky, uh, 
and Hezbollah, the Iranians, and all the different mercenary groups that have come from the East, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so forth. The Syrian Arab army, as I've regularly said, is hardly Arab anymore, right? Yeah. It's like a Syrian Persian army or something like this, yeah? yeah? But how do we respond to the following? The country is decimated. It's been, it's in rubble. Uh, it's been bombed back to the, the Stone Ages. Half a million at least conservative estimate have died. More than half the population of the country are displaced, are living outside the country. Um, and you guys are responsible for it. You guys in the UK, you Mozambik, you Didi Hussein, you guys who, 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 who beat the drums of the revolution in the early days, right? Without sacrificing your sons, your children, your families. Look at the situation now. How do you feel about the situation now? How, how do we deal with this? Because that's something, I, I get this quite a bit. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing is that such people don't understand the reasons, the history behind it. This isn't just the Assad regime. This is half is an Assad that so, came before and what they did to the people. As I said, one of the reasons why the people were so, uh, um, so silenced for so long is because of the brutality of the father, of Bashar's father. And so they remained silent up until the point at which there was a... a um, the ability to stand up once more. And in the beginning, they didn't call for bringing down the regime. They, for they just wanted reform. Reform, yeah. And then famously, when people like that young boy, Hamza al-Khatib, was so, taken into captivity and then literally skinned alive. And mutilated, and, yes. And mutilated. Yep. And one by one, women were taken into custody and tortured and abused. And this government did what it did best. And that was through iron and fire, uh, drive a wedge between the people and itself and to ensure that make that these people, you cannot raise your head and we will do to you what we always do. And we've done his, what we did to your fathers. The difference was this time around that there was a movement of people who had had experiences before and there was a mass movement of people who said, we've had enough. And in the areas where the government had less control, remember the Free Syrian Army members, how were they How were they the Free Syrian Army? They were members of the Free Syrian defectors. Army. Yeah. They're defectors. They defected from the army itself. Riyad al-Assad was the, was the founder of, of this Free Syrian Army and, and its head. And he, to him, it was very clear that uh, we will fight this government uh, and we are an Islamic move. We are an Islamic people, a Sunni Muslim people, and we have been brutalized by them, not because they're Alawis or Shias, but because they have had used the stamp of tyranny on us. And if they happen to be from those groups, then so be it. But that wasn't really the call. The call was that we want to be able to remove this government and, and determine our own future as Muslims. Can it still be, look, look, can it still be argued though, right? Uh, as 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 incorrect and un un islamic that it may even sound, that look, you know, those people they rose up, and you know, they lost they lost their lives perhaps in vain, right? That, that that look at the state of their country. Had they not rose up, had they not rose up, they would have had a home. They would have had a roof over their head. Fine, they would have lived under br uh, uh, brutal oppression and tyranny. But there would have been some level of security and stability, uh, you know. How do you respond to this? Because you know, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا تَدْرِي النَّفْسُ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى وَمَا تَدْرِي النَّفْسُ فِي أَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتِ Allah says that the, the soul doesn't know uh, what will transpire tomorrow and he doesn't know which land he will die in. So this is the ghaib. Now we're talking about the ghaib. At the time when people rose up, uh, they were responding to things that were happening to their family members. Now it's very easy for us to sit around here and say that we would do that. Would you remain silent if your mother was being taken into a, 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 an interrogation room and violated physically or your son was taken and tortured? Would you actually uh, tell everybody, yes, remain silent? In fact, you would be the one that would be running around trying to find and rescue them. So this is a very arrogant position for anybody to say, especially when the protests were peaceful to start off with. I've met many people who were part of those protests. I've seen videos of people who were shot and killed while they were protesting without weapons. I went and lived in Syria amongst the Syrian people in a village uh, uh, where story after story uh, was about how they peacefully tried and were forced to pick up arms to defend them. So I think there's a, so that, so I'm, I'm glad you raised that because there's a massive misconception, one that's been peddled by the pro Russians, pro pro axes of resistance kind of guys, yeah. That is that. Oh, you know, there were infiltrators within the protests, and it was a Zionist instigation, etc. Let's ignore that kind of madness, yeah. But I think even amongst 
mainstream Sunni Muslims, they're still, and the reason why I say mainstream Sunni Muslims, I don't, I'm not doing this purposely to make the conflict a sectarian thing, even though it took that turn anyway. That there's this misconception that, you know, somehow the Ummah, the masses, the Awam, they raised arms. They don't understand that essentially it was a defensive thing. That the regime and their thugs, the Shabih and others, were the ones that raised arms, were the ones that started shooting at unarmed protesters. That there were villages that were threatened by these guys that come in to raid homes, kick their doors in, take their women folk, and therefore they had to defend themselves. That's a major, like, yeah. it, so let's go back to the, the same thing. You know, where, where did the arms come from? You know, were they dropped from the skies? You yeah. know, were they American weapons? Were they yeah. using M16s or were they using Russian AK 47s, which were provided? Uh, to the Syrians by the Russians. Of course, the latter is true, mm. which means that the arms and the first resistance, armed resistance, started from uh, defectors yeah. from the from the military, and then it moved on to other groups that were uh, more focused, that had experience perhaps in fighting in Afghanistan or in Iraq or elsewhere. But the point was here is that there was a unified response uh, against a government that was using arms, mm. and uh, and not just arms, but uh, after after they were using light arms, they were using aerial uh, bombardment in, in regions on its own people. In civilian regions. In civilian regions, yeah. right. So they had to fight. But they had absolutely no choice because those who would say, um, well, you know, look what it got them. Uh, you know, victory and uh, defeat are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the Battle of Uhud, the Munafiqeen said, look, had you not gone out like we told you, you wouldn't have lost. And when they won, like at the Battle of Badr, they would say, "Inna kunna ma'akum." Yeah, yeah. We were with you all the way. Yeah, yeah. So you have to remember that there is this is this is may Allah protect all of us from it. But this I is mean. one of the signs of nifaq is that when you say that, well, look, look, all those people they died for nothing. Um, the shuhada of of Uhud did they die for nothing? Did Hamza ibn al Abdul Muttalib, who the Prophet ﷺ said is Sayyid al Shuhada, he is the master of the martyrs. That he that somehow somebody would mm. say because they lost, uh, therefore. He died in vain. Nobody would dare say such a thing. Of course. So the reward of each person is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the losses uh, exist because of the, I would call it, the treachery of multiple nations uh, and the very fact that they allowed this to happen. Uh, the use of chemical weapons is, you know, we or the, the world invaded Iraq on the notion that perhaps, maybe, possibly, there might be WMS. chemical weapons there. Yeah. But there was never never any there. Of course. Uh, in Syria, well, sarin, ga sarin gas, yep. chlorine gas, yep. barrel gums have been documented by the United That's Nations right. being used. It was put as a red line by Obama. Mm. What happened? Absolutely nothing. Mm. So what it shows you is that this is because of the khiana, because of the treachery of world powers, that why, what, why this has happened to Syria, not because the Syrians rose up against oppression. So again, moving backwards, right? Because I want the viewers and the listeners to understand how we, inshallah, in this podcast, will at least attempt to kind of untangle some of the some of the situations that have occurred in Syria. So right now, you spoke about the Free Syrian Army being the first initial uh, resistance to the regime, and they were essentially made up, if not entirely made up, of army defectors, yeah? Yes. But as it stands now, we have a situation where in Idlib, there are certain factions like Hayat al-Tahrir al-Sham and, and others, right? Um, you have the kind of Free Syrian army who are pretty much pro-Turkey. You've got the Kurdish uh, factions, which are somewhat loyal to PKK, the YPG and these guys. But essentially, the, the regime has taken control of nearly 75% plus of Syria. So how did we get to a situation where in January 2015, the rebel factions were knocking on the gates of Damascus, literally at the brink of victory and taking Damascus, to where we find ourselves now where Idlib appears to be the major last point of resistance? How did we get to that? Um, well, there have been multiple multiple reasons in, 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 in this. And well, let's, well, let's talk about the disunity of the rebel factions. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's going to be one of the ones. Allah, I mean, let's just go back to Pope Francis. Allah says, you know, is that once you, you start to bicker amongst yourselves, then you will uh, you will dissipate your strength and you will be become, uh, you know, unable to, to maintain victory. So that's obviously what's happened. Uh, there was a time, I think I wrote in 2014, 13, this was before I was arrested and uh, imprisoned for sending a generator to Syria. Yeah. To Syria. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but one of those things was that uh, I wrote that there was a thousand groups in Syria at that time. And this is the time when the groups were relatively united. They were, they were regionally different groups. Of course. Um, and they, there were many unity initiatives. Mm. And one after the other failed. And I think this is a, a major problem in Syria if you compare it to other places where there's been uh, mass resistance, like unified resistance. We'll take, for example, Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, Taliban there, now you can see they're sitting with the United States of America. The Americas, Americans are negotiating with them. Uh, and not just them, <laughs> our former uh, comrades, as it were, in, in Guantanamo mm. are the ones that are sitting with the Americans. So these worst of the worst prisoners are now negotiating America's withdrawal from, uh, from Afghanistan. So they come from a tradition uh, where you follow one school of thought, you have one leadership, one decision-making process. And it's simple, whether you've got an occupying power like the Soviets or the, the Americans. Um, you deal with it essentially in the same way. You try to unify in the best way you can. Here in Syria, it was totally different where everybody had their own opinion. Everybody. But why? Why was it different? Why was it that we had numerous factions, even like kind of internally? You know, I remember the, the piece that you really spoke about, a thousand factions. And there were so many attempts at unifying. Why was Syria like that? I mean, it varied from different places. I remember I met the, I, I knew fairly well, uh, the leader of Harakat Ahrar, Sham al-Islami, uh, which which was Hassan Aboud, yes. may Allah have mercy on him. I mean, and I met him and several times, and his group and his organizers, and they were, they were the biggest at that. Time. They were the yes, yeah, for, at that time were the biggest, most well organized, um, and they wanted. They used the term the revolution, continued to use the term the revolution for the Syrian people, and him and the leadership of of Ahrar al-Sham were all killed in a bombing. Uh, which still nobody knows who did it. Because there was a gathering of meetings, yeah. and, and then obviously there must have been a leak to the regime, and, the, and there was a planned attack, wasn't well, it? Well, it could have been the regime, it could have been internal factions, it could have been ISIS. Um, and all of, because I remember he was one of the first voices speaking out against ISIS, not because of to, to please the West or anything, but because he saw where it was coming from, he saw the direction it was taking, and he saw that this is the first major splinter it's going to cause within the revolution that is taking away from the project of bringing down the regime and talking about setting up a khilafah elsewhere, which isn't the priority when you're getting your sisters taken into prison Absolutely. and raped on on uh, on mass uh, in that regard. So uh, people like them were, were killed and taken out. Um, and then other organizations who perhaps were not as well known uh, started to vie for power. Uh, there were unity initiatives and repeatedly there were... Um, factions that were supported by either the Americans financially or the Turks or the Saudis or the Qataris and they were vying for power and unfortunately I think many of these groups fell foul of uh, that financial support and that influence that was coming from there. So is that entirely their fault then? So when we talk about the internal bickering among the different factions, at the mo at, at, let's be realistic about it, they were, they were reliant on funds and money, I mean, funds and weapons. Yes. When, you're re when, when, you're, when you're reliant on external powers, on money and weapons, you can't help but avoid bickering, right? And that, that, was, a, that was an issue with um, Jabhat al-Nusra, who later became HTS, and Ahral al-Sham, and Jaysh al-Islam, and FS. They all had this problem. Yeah. They, were, they were factions that were reliant on weapons and money from external players. And let's also be honest about it, right? Or at least this is how I read it. Those external players, especially the Gulf countries that were giving weapons and money, it was essentially with the nod and approval of America, right? Yeah. They would never have independently or in, in exclusively independently gave it. Once Washington put the heat on them to say either say yay or nay, the funding and the weapons stopped, right? Had, had, so, had we, had, it was inevitable, surely. Yes, I mean this is one of the one one of the uh, things that people need to realize from the past is and, and people always will always say that if you're in ascendancy, well, who's funding you? Who, but one of the history, one of the things we know from history and and from any resistance movement is that resistance movements, uh, jihad movements in the Muslim world, especially when they've been attacked from one from from a, a group of of, of powers, um, have the ability to capture their own weapons to uh, get support from people on the ground themselves, everybody donating 10 or 15 reals from whatever mm. 100 that they, they get in the week. So there is a system that they can build to defend themselves uh, that's, ex that's not, in includes being, being, being supported by an outside power because an outside power comes with those strings and those yes, conditions. of course. And I think perhaps now, 
um, how Idlib is, it may be in that way, that they're more self-sufficient, less reliant on, on foreign, because they've seen what happens as a result of it. Mm. And primarily the Syrians need to be in control uh, of everything and not outside powers for whatever reason, even if they're quote unquote Muslims, uh, because everybody has their own interests at heart and the people on the ground in Syria have their interests primarily at heart. Uh, so I think they've fallen foul mm. uh, of these uh, various nations and governments. Either they're attacking them from the air uh, with weapons or attacking them on the ground with weapons or with money or both. And uh, unsurprising now that that's destroyed the country. If they can't keep united in, in Idlib, then that will fall too. Russia's, Russia's involvement in 2016 that was a game changer, right? Well, there was two things that happened in 2000. Uh, I think mid late 2013, British government sought a parliamentary uh, 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 vote to bomb the Assad regime because yeah. of the use of uh, chemical weapons and so mm. forth. They failed in that, yeah. and as a result of that, shortly afterwards, British policy started to change. So they were supporting the Free Syrian Army with non-lethal aid up until January 2004. What kind of non-lethal aid are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about generators, talking about um, perhaps body armor, um, anything that's non-lethal, yeah. um, night vision equipment, what, or that sort of stuff. Then they stopped. Uh, the Americans continued, and they continued to support various factions using weapons, not with lethal aid as well, mm. uh, but these were pro-government, pro-US yeah. factions, and they were seen to be that. So their job really wasn't to fight the regime, it was to fight other uh, Islamic organizations. Yeah, yeah. So there was Harakat al-Hazm, for example, yes. which was one of them. And they quickly dissipated. They received a lot of money, a lot of anti-aircraft, anti-tank missile systems and so forth. Um, and that organizations like that actually caused huge rifts amongst the various groups as if there wasn't enough. Um, so what once that had started to start its process, um, the, the, the breakup as it were, uh, so the West started to pull back. ISIS rose out of all of that, and that became the excuse to basically say, "Well, they're all the same. They're all they're all kind of ISIS like. Aren't yeah, they? yeah. They're all they're all saying Allah Akbar yeah, yeah, yeah. At, in a battlefield. Mm. They're all saying we're, we're we're martyrs, and basically we we can't trust any of them. Yeah, yeah. So the West then started to pull back, and but it was in a in a in a conundrum because on the one hand they were saying sarin gas is being used against these people. And we have to defend human rights. On the other, uh, ISIS is bombing people in Britain, in France, in in other Western countries. That's the priority. So let me just so let me just ask you: this. Does it come as some of an irony that the British uh, government, and here I'm not talking about neither you or I supporting intervention here. I'm just talking about on an initial principle that isn't it somewhat ironical that the British Parliament voted against military intervention in 2013 against the Assad regime for him using chemical weapons. But then I believe it was 2015 or 16, correct me Muslim, when they voted in support to bomb Syria, Raqqa, because of ISIS. Absolutely. That here we have a regime that has literally killed hundreds, thousands of his people, used chemical weapons. Let's see, I don't even know why we have to keep on mentioning chemical weapons. Khalas, even it, let's put the chemical weapons aside. This, this criminal has been bombing his people indiscriminately and has the blood of hundreds of thousands of people. There was no movement, no fly zone, no intervention, no nothing. Comes along ISIS, criminal organization, but you cannot even compare the death toll. The de yeah, but there was intervention. There was a 70 nation coalition to bomb ISIS. The disparity. Isn't it somewhat of an irony and hypocrisy? It's the greatest hypocrisy you can imagine. As I said to you before, that um, they invaded Iraq and dismembered Iraq. Ironically, the rise of ISIS only happened because of the dismemberment of Iraq. Uh, ISIS, 17 of ISIS's top leaders were in Camp Bukha. Yeah, all and, and, yeah, and ISI, uh, Islamic State in Iraq, actually began in Iraq. And that's where ISIS was, was, was built and started. So that's the irony of in response to the U.S. led invasion. Yeah, because and that invasion was because uh, there was a notion that perhaps there might be chemical weapons there, and so th this is the greatest irony at all. And if you go back even a little bit further, just Iraq did have chemical weapons. They did use them against the Iranians in the the war against the first Gulf War yeah, yeah. against the Iranians. But at that time, the British government and the American government actually hated the Iranians. So they were the ones who gave him the chemical exactly. weapons to begin with. So that's why they believed he had the chemical weapons. He got rid of them uh, during the inspection time. Um, but that didn't stop them invading the country. 
So the role of the West cannot be understated in, dis in, in, in disintegrating and destabilizing that entire region. Um, and by the time ISIS comes along, uh, that becomes the excuse again to bomb there. But if you ask ordinary Syrian people, yes, we probably uh, when we're shedding no tears over the death of Baghdadi, but really, Assad is the one that's been killing us for all these years. What have you done about that? I'll tell you what's happened. The United States fired, I think, uh, 39 odd missiles, Tomahawk missiles, at Syrian air bases uh, in 2016. Hmm. And this was as a response to uh, the, the, the allegation that chemical weapons were used against Syrian yeah. people. How they fired these was very interesting. They coordinated with the Russians yeah. who were helping the Syrians. Exactly. The Syrians then made sure that every uh, soldier and military person was, was not present. Was not present. And they hit areas, empty homes and empty places, empty buildings. And I think, as I, as I, uh, I may be wrong, three or four soldiers were killed. And I uh, jokingly say America normally kills 10 times that number by mistake, <laughs> uh, let alone... Uh, targeted strikes. So what did you do? It was just a token oh, sure. strike. And so this tokenism has continued. How can you, how can you um, uh, coordinate with the very people that are carrying out these weapon, th these um, atrocities? And they're the same people that you're supposed to attack. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense at all. So other than, you know, I, I called it the, you know, the British, the French, the Americans, uh, several Gulf states, the Russians, the Iranians. What they took part in was an aerial gang rape of Syria, and they're still doing it. How true is the statement that one of the reasons why Western powers at least uh, did not militarily intervene or did not uh, fully, were not fully committed to regime change like they were perhaps in Libya, was that because they could not secure a reliable faction that was subservient to their interests in Syria. And what they actually identified was that the most effective and most powerful factions in Syria actually happened to be Islamic or Islamically orientated. Whatever aspirations they have, if Assad falls, is some type of Islamic governance independent of Western uh, interests in the region. How true do you feel that that is? You know, one of the things I think that we, we need to remember is that, uh, you know, everybody in the Middle East becomes Islamic when there's war, even the atheists, yeah. even the Ba'athists. So, you know, famously <laughs> Saddam Hussein, you know, the Iraqi flag didn't have Allahu Akbar written it, yeah. written it until, the first, until the first Gulf War began. So everybody starts to become Islamic. Everybody oh. uses language. If you listen to Bashar Assad, he quotes ayat and hadith yeah, yeah, yeah. when he speaks, okay, and even though he doesn't believe in half of them. Yeah. Um, so everybody becomes Islamic. And the biggest mistake the West makes every time is that every time you hear somebody talking about um, governance from an Islamic perspective, yeah. you start seeing them through the lens of, of suspicion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, you're right. You know, they talk about getting votes to bomb a country. Well, they didn't need any vote to bomb Libya. Exactly. They didn't ask for any vote. Yeah. They just bombed and, and, mm. and, and did it as they wished. Um, interestingly, many of this, the, the people who had worked started the revolution in, in, in Libya and taken part in it, uh, militarily had some experience, actually went on to set up and support some of the first resistance movements in Syria. So these very Libyans yeah. had gone from uh, Libya and, and joined and fought against uh, uh, Assad with the Sufi Syrian army. Uh, so they, inter they weren't going to intervene in the same way. And obviously because of several reasons. One primary reason is the one that we hear from Donald Trump right now. Hmm. And he said, we have secured the oil. I mean, he mentioned the word oil five times at yeah, the yeah. conference saying, yeah, we've secured the oil. We've secured well, first of all, that's not your oil. Yeah. You just said that you're leaving that area two weeks ago and now you're back again. But he also, uh, said, he also said that they're entitled to some of the oil. Yeah, they're well. entitled to some of the oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so of course, at least with Trump, you can say that he's the most honest. Honest, yeah. He's the most honest. Yeah. Um, he's not duplicitous in the way that others have been and saying that, that you know, as Allah says, they say on their tongues that which is not in their heart. Yeah. He says what's in his yeah, heart. Literally. Literally, he tweaks it out as well. Yeah. Um, so, of course, this, there was no, that interest didn't exist. Um, and, and Syria is, is, is a closer fault line. There are so many different regions and factions that are close by, the Lebanese, the Christian militias, Israel, 
the various uh, Sunni groups and so forth. And they probably weighed it all up and said, yes, we can help to destabilize. We can support one faction against the other. And we can say we're the good guys. We can, uh, we, we can do all of that. Um, but we won't put anybody on the ground, which is right because they haven't experienced on there. Mm. Uh, ex except, of course, when they do put people on the ground, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, they did, <laughs> like they did two days ago. So you know, let's 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 address another elephant in the room, right? And, and one of the elephants in the room uh, is this formation that seems to be appearing between Turkey, Russia, and Iran, right? But mainly Turkey and Russia, but also with Iran's involvement as somewhat more viable peacemakers for Syria uh, or, or some kind of effort towards a, a political solution. Um, I don't know about you, Mozan, when I see that, that hurts. It hurts because I know that Mr. Erdogan has many, many supporters uh, in the Muslim world and in the Western world, people that are very dear to us, very close to us, uh, practically, you know, you know, think he's the best thing since sliced bread, Yeah. And I also appreciate that the difficulties, the obstacles, the challenges of being a leader of a nation is something which perhaps the normal average job block can't comprehend and can't really fathom because of so many different things that are involved. Is Russia, Iran and Turkey, them three working together, are they a, 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 a better alternative for peace in Syria than... The other the other attempts that we've had, led by the US and others, um, I I think neither are. I think everyone's after their own respective interests. Turkey obviously has taken uh, millions of Syrians of refugees. I believe it's three or four million they've taken, if not more. So obviously they've got a lot more to think about. But in terms of peace in Syria, there's this now this new projection: that Russia, Turkey, and Iran can yeah. somehow come to some kind of solution in Syria. I mean, you've asked multiple questions essentially that require lots of answers here but you know just the, the notion of peace in syria how does peace in syria work does it you can get peace in syria by handing everything over to assad that assad takes power and there's peace uh you can get peace in syria by having intervention by the turks and ensuring that they maintain a corridor between them and the and, and the assad regime for, at least for which is what they did under operation um uh euphrates shield for a while at least to protect some of those areas um, but the larger question really is, what do they intend to do with these people? What do they intend to do with uh, Idlib, which is under the governance of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which people claim is a is a, a banned terrorist organization mm -hmm. that is an incarnation of Jabhat Fatah al-Sham, which in itself is an incarnation of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda yeah, yeah. in Syria. Mm -hmm. Um, though they have tried repeatedly again and again and again and to, to disassociate yeah, themselves yeah. from Al-Qaeda's methodology, from the aims and objectives and so forth. Um, it's still a banned organization even in Turkey. Uh, so the reality is they have to deal with these people as, as a government, even if they don't recognize them. And uh, the Turks will, will forever hold a great deal of love in the hearts of Muslims. There's no doubt about it because they hold, they held the seat of Islam the, for, 600 for, for 600 years. years. Yeah. Um, people say that Erdogan describes himself or plays himself as a, like a new, a new sultan, as it were. Um, I don't know if that's the case necessarily, but just to be just to the Turks for the moment and, and recognize, as you said, they've taken in close to 4 million refugees. They've been, and I've seen refugee centers in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and other. The, the centers that they've built in uh, Turkey are fully functioning small towns and cities, uh, the likes of which have not been built in other places. So they have tried their best in one way. But Turkey is out for Turkey. Turkey is looking out for Turkey. And you can't blame them in that regard. What you can blame them for is when they make a deal with other nations and make the Syrians believe that Turkey is going to defend us. And then when it comes down to the crunch, they will be left to their own devices. And if it means handing them back over to to Syria, to, to the Syrian regime, then that's a price worth paying to maintain Turkey's own security. That's the biggest problem. And if that happens, then the Syrians will see Turkey as a sellout, as a nation that has sold it out, even if it looked out of its own interests. If the deaths of millions of people 
can be justified by that. I can understand handing over small areas and so forth, but a regime that has consistently killed so many people and doing a deal with them as if these people don't matter with Russia that is delivering the ordinance daily on the heads of Literally. the Syrian people, uh, how you can do a deal with them that sells them down the river, uh, I don't know how that can be maintained. Is this still an element amongst... Is this an element amongst many Muslims that we still somehow expect Islamic, even this term Islamic leadership or, or an Islamic ruler? You know, depending on who you speak to, there's there's many shanty definitions and criteria for what this constitutes us. But is this still an expectation, a false expectation that we expect certain Islamic deliverables from the rulers of today? Like for example, I was speaking to a brother who's currently in Bosnia, and he was, he was for the first time, he, he exp he's experienced from the people what happened in Srebrenica and so forth. And you were there yourself, right, back in the day. <clears throat> and he said, oh, the rulers let them down, the, the leaders let them down. And I said, what, but what did you expect from Muslim rulers who are rulers of secular nation states? who essentially have to answer to their masters in NATO and in Washington and so forth. What did you expect from them? Did you expect them to come and march to the frontiers? And, and, and Of course, we don't want that, but to expect that, isn't that a bit idealistic? So when we talk about Turkey making a deal with the Russians, who are literally bombing our brothers and sisters on a daily basis, right? They've hit Erdogan or Turkey making a deal with the Russians, or they've sold the Syrians out. Isn't that in and of itself an idealistic expectation from the Turks and Erdogan? Um, maybe it wasn't. That's not the impression Turkey gave. It's not the impression Erdogan gave. It's not the impression they, when they literally were supporting the revolution, literally were supporting the various factions. It's not the impression they gave. It's not. It, it was as if we are with you. And literally calling for regime change up until 2015. Yeah, I was, I was in Libya in 2012 <clears throat> when Erdogan came. Yeah. And I remember, I, I recorded the, the video. His speaking has been translated into Arabic. And there's a whole massive crowd of people there. And he's saying, you are the sons. Antum Ahfad Omar al-Mukhtar. You are the, the, uh, the descendants of Omar al-Mukhtar, the great Mujahid who fought against the, the, Italian, um, uh, the Italians. And he said, today, Libya, wa ghadan Syria. And he shouts, Syria, Syria. And everybody's going, Syria, Syria, Syria. That, so clearly, he's supporting it. Um, uh, uh, the regime change. That people need to rise up mm -hmm. and do in in Syria, what they did in Libya. So that was an expectation. And the people did so as a, partly because they felt that the powerful NATO neighbor is in support of us. Um, they were, I, my belief is they would have done so regardless. The, because the, you can only live under the yoke of oppression for so long. Your, your children might see you as a, you know, as when you're a father and they see you brutalized daily, they see you humiliated daily, they see that you, can't say if you say something you'll be tortured or abused or live in a state of fear either those children are going to grow up just like you or they're going to say i don't want to be like my dad i never wanted to. and that's going to happen mm. so there was a generation of children that was going to rise up regardless you can't oppress people that long and expect generations to live under oppression mm. it was going to happen so whether they were helped or, or whether they weren't um that was that was in allah's hands you know um is there a reason why, if you look at the Arab Spring, right, and we look at Tunisia, we look at Libya, we look at Bahrain, you know, people tend to forget Bahrain. You know, if you look at Bahrain, we look at Yemen, we look at Syria, look at Egypt, those six, seven countries, right? Why, why do you believe that Syria became the way it was compared to, let's say, in Tunisia, where there was, Ben Ali was kind of removed with a, a, a somewhat bloodless transition, right? In Egypt, of course, <clears throat> similar case, some people were killed, but generally there was a popular protest. Uh, Mubarak stood down, Mursi came to power, and of course, the treacherous coup that took place against him and then uh, Rabah happened. But generally, the, the initial revolution in Egypt was nowhere close to as bloody as uh, Syria at all. I guess in order of conflict, it was Syria first, Libya, maybe Yemen, and then, of course, uh, Tunisia, uh, Bahrain, well, nothing, nothing really happened in Bahrain in terms of removing the leadership there. Why did Syria take that turn? Why? Is it because of the involvement of all the different players? Well, there's that, but there's also, as I said, there's a, there's a, there's a history in Syria. 
I, I want to tell you just one little story, story. I met this young young boy when I was in Syria. He was about 17 years old. He was from Hama. And he said something really, really shocking to me. He looks at a little boy. Uh, and this is in Turkey. Uh, the boy's about maybe three, four years old. And he said to me, could you kill that child? I said, no, I do, I do everything to protect it. He said, I could. I said, why would you do such a thing? He said, my parents were killed during the Hama uprising. My sister and my brother are in prison right now. I think my sister's being raped every single day. Then he showed me his hand and two of his fingers are cut off. And he was 17 years old and he joined one of the rebel factions and he was just here for a short while in Turkey, uh, ready to, to go back in to fight. He had been terribly affected, um, traumatized to the point at which what war does to a person, what uh, this type of behavior does to people. And he was to me just a symptom of what's happening in the rest of the country, that this, this war is gonna become very, very brutal. There's no doubt in my mind. If you brutalize somebody, they're not going to grow up to sing your praises. Even if Asa takes the whole country back? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's going to be people who forever, they will fight him. It's, it's too close. It's too deep. It's too personal for some of them. Um, and I can understand that totally. If you go to the hospitals, I used to go to the hospitals and see wounded people every single day. Children with their legs blown off. It's the, we were just recently talking about... Um, a film that was made for Sama, for Sama, yes. That was featured on, on uh, uh, Channel 4. Bawad al Khatib. Yeah, and, you know, everybody must watch this. I mean, if, if you turn away every time you see something on your, on your Twitter feed or on your uh, Facebook feed, you turn away every time there's, there's something that's uh, remotely connected to atrocities, you don't look at it. I don't. I try to look, not look at it anymore. I can't handle it. But I have to watch this. I forced myself. Same, same. I said, I have to cry. I have to feel bad. I have to feel as if that's my children. And if once you start to do that and seeing that this is what's happened in our lifetime, put aside the West, put aside the powers. What did we do as individuals from amongst our communities? And we could be proud for a short amount of time. British Muslim community sent over um, ambulances. They sent over dump, uh, you know, rubbish trucks, fire trucks, built hospitals. There was brothers I know there Spano, who killed the uh, doctors, a famous, a really good brother, Dr. Isa Abdurrahman mm. from London, yes. uh, Dr. Abbas Khan yes, was captured and, and tortured and killed by the regime. There was, the British Muslim community became very well known in Syria for, its, for what it was doing. Convoys of hundreds of it. We still have Brits out there. Yeah, there are still Brits out there. Dr. Shah Jul talks, his wife. Many people, yeah. Many people, I talk to them regularly and, yeah. and their sacrifices still haven't been recognized. If they had been white Western Europeans working in a war zone, they'd be receiving some kind of Nobel Peace Prize. They'd be celebrated as heroes. It's, of course they would they'd be. be celebrated as but heroes. the thing is that even our community isn't celebrating them. And that's because of a fear that's been imposed upon ourselves that you look away. The more you look away, the less you think it'll affect you. But um, the truth is that it, you know, it affects us every single day. Uh, whether it's through the du'as of those people, whether it's through the application of laws in this country that affect us uh, directly as a result of what's happening in Syria. Uh, looking away, to me, is not an option. And that's why I think that a lot of people have done this um, and don't want to talk about the subject. As you said earlier on, there are people that are well-known in our community for uh, uh, many things uh, who will say, I don't know enough about what's happening over there. Ya Rabbil mm. it's been going on for eight years. Uh, it, it, you will, we will be held accounted for. So, and if we, we say, well, we didn't know what we could do, what could we have done? There's a lot you can do. And one of the things you can do is to make sure that knowledge about that situation, if you don't know, then you have to know. Whoever is not concerned with the affairs of Muslims is not from amongst them. Yes. It's a serious hadith. Yeah. And I'm glad you kind of, you've brought the Syrian conflict back to how it affects us in the UK and broadly speaking in the West. It affected you in 2014 when you were arrested and remanded uh, for Syria-related terrorist activities. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. I'm going to forget. And because it actually happened uh, two days before my engagement. And uh, so I'll always remember that. <laughs> what happened about that? Well, I had an engagement too. Yeah. <laughs> I had an engagement with the court. Yeah. Um, which didn't happen. You didn't get your court, your day in court. Well, no, it was just a magistrate's court. So yeah. It was just a, a preliminary uh, hearing. 
So what happened is that I was, uh, I'd got, I'd been in Syria from 2012 to 13 yeah. and lived there with my family. My wife was working in the hospital there. I was doing my investigations, actually looking at to see uh, how many people I could find that had been rendered by the Americans and the British to Assad. That was my primary investigation. So I was meeting these people uh, who, who had uh, been victims of this so-called anti-imperialist working with, with America. Were the authorities aware of your visit? Yeah, they were aware because they they, uh, they called me once um, and said, because I'd written about my visit, a prior visit to the, that we'd like to talk to you about Syria. I said, fine, that's, that's no problem, but let me warn you that I'm going there to investigate your role in, with the Assad regime. And they were shocked that I would say such a thing. They called back and said, we'd like to meet you, but our lawyer will be present. Mm -hmm. so MI5 is telling me their lawyer will be present. So I said, okay, I'll turn up to this meeting. And I took my lawyer also. The lawyer sat and spoke. And, and I told them again, I said, listen, you know, I don't know what you're really interested in. Uh, in if you think there's a threat at that time, 2012, there was no ISIS. Um, my per primary reason is to go there to look at what you have been doing with the Assad regime, that you worked with the Assad regime, like you worked with the Gaddafi regime in the renditions program. Um, and that's what I want to bring out. So when I went to Syria, eventually I did meet with some former rendition victims, but they were a little bit busy fighting a regime yeah. um, and they had other things on there in their mind. I returned anyway in 2013 before, again, no, ISIS didn't exist. The following year, so a year later, I was returning from a trip uh, to South Africa and um, there were police officers waiting at the airport mm. and they told me we are removing your passport. Yeah, your passport is a privilege, not a right. And uh, they took it. I was fast tracked through immigration because I had no passport to go through. VIP. VIP. <laughs> uh, three months, two and a half months later, uh, about 150 police officers turn up to my house. 150. And this is the same police officers, police force that is understaffed, that they don't have enough police officers to, street, to, to deal with street crime. 150 police officers turn up in my house in February 2014 to arrest me. And arrest me for what? For sending a generator to one of the brothers in Syria who's fighting against the regime. And this is the same and, kind of generator for, that the British government was given to. Of which they'd given, the British government had given a thousand generators and for giving them fitness training, uh, literally press ups, set ups, and, and, and that sort of stuff. Do you do that? Oz? I do press ups and set ups. I can give you, I can, <laughs> I can challenge you. I thought before coming here, what could I challenge him on? I know these guys, they do arm wrestling and stuff. I probably won't be able to beat him on that. Yeah. But you know what? Can you do press ups on two fingers? No, One I, arm. I can try. Okay, yalla, yalla, let me Can get to press ups upside down. No, no, I can't. Yeah, no, okay, no. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, maybe I'll challenge him to stuff that I know he can't do. <laughs> uh, <he done> me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was I was I was charged with that. I remained on remand as a category A prisoner in high security Belmarsh, Belmarsh. alongside uh, people who've been convicted forty life year sentences. With life years, yeah. And I I was there. Uh, for seven months, and then on the day that I was supposed to go to trial, they dropped every charge. Why? There were several reasons. One is that I would have a precedent would have been established in British law that what I did in Syria, which was uh, um, supp supplying a generator or even giving fitness training to the free to the to the rebels, was not terrorism. So if you're going there to help people to defend themselves against um, brutal regimes, it's not terrorism and a precedent would have been established. And they couldn't have that because the policy in Syria had changed. The other thing was um, that it also exposed, I, I was involved in the, uh, the, the process to negotiate for the release of Alan Henning hmm. several times. Before my arrest, I'd gone to one of the ministers in government, to Al to Alistair Burt, who was the undersecretary of, of the foreign office, and told him I'm trying to get Alan Henning released through my contacts there. Uh, the, the police also came to see me, so not the police, the foreign office, mm. they came to see me in Belmarsh. Uh, when I had requested for them, when they put images of James Foley who'd been executed yeah. by ISIS, I said, please let me negotiate or try to send a message from in prison calling for Alan Henning's release. And so they came to see me, I wrote a message in Arabic, in English. Uh, in the end, they, they refused to allow me to send a, a video recorded message from in, uh, from Belmarsh, but they said, we'll send your messages through private channels. I didn't know they had, the government had private channels with ISIS. Mm. I was released when the, uh, two days later, uh, and literally the day after I was released, I heard that Alan Henning was, was executed. Killed, yeah. yeah. 
So Syria has been a conflict which has affected Muslims directly. It's impacted us directly through laws like the CTS Act 2015. And, and we know that so many uh, charities and aid workers have been harassed uh, by the, the MI5 and, and the police. Um, and I would also even say that one of the reasons why a number of du'at and prominent scholars who are very, very supportive and very, very outspoken uh, at the beginning, in the early days of the Syrian conflict, have now either become, you know, very quiet on purpose to avoid controversy, to avoid heat, to avoid any accusations of being a supporter of one faction or another. Or two, they've kind of retracted their initial position of support. What advice would you give to those community leaders? And I would even go as far as say, those that are close to you and I, Muslim. Right, brothers, sincere brothers who we both know, uh, you know, who have following, who have a, a massive audience, that they are were either once very vocal in support of uh, the Thawra, the, the revolution in in Syria and the masses there, or they are intentionally remaining quiet. Well, what would your advice be to these brothers and respected uh, scholars? Uh, unfortunately, uh, fear is, is prevalent. Uh, as a result of of uh, legislation, um, media uh, assaults constantly on Muslims who speak out or, or talk about issues related to the Muslim community and politics or what's happening on the ground. The aid organisations, as you rightly said, have been targeted repeatedly. Repeatedly, harassed. Uh, for hours and hours on end, targeted under the Charities Commission. Money confiscated. And hundreds of thousands of pounds confiscated, confiscated yep. at borders under various uh, laws. So there's, there's, there is there is a, a full spectrum uh, attempt by the government to silence anybody uh, in this regard. Quickly, why Syria again? Why is it that this particular revolution, this particular conflict has had that kind of impact? Libya didn't have this. Yes. Bosnia didn't have this. Any other conflict that I recall, Afghanistan, Iraq didn't have this. Why is that Syria has had this? But there's literally been a look, Syria related terrorism acts, yeah. Syria related t- uh, terrorism. Literally, there's like a, there's, there's new laws that were born out of what's happening in Syria. Why? Because yeah. Syria, as I told you, this is this fault line. You know, um, there was another war that happened not too long ago where the Soviets came in on the side of the government, a government that the uh, United States didn't like. Um, and an ordinary people that fought against uh, that government. And that was Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation. Mm. There, the Americans supplied, for example, Stinger anti-aircraft missile systems to the Mujahideen, which became a, a game changer in, um, in changing the direction of the war. No Americans died in that war, so they can't take any credit for it. But at least, uh, you know, they were supporting uh, against a, a Cold War. This time around, the Americans have been supporting against ISIS and ISIS only, not against the government. So why Syria? First of all, Syria is a land of blessing for Muslims. So. Syria is a land, it's not just Syria, it's the entire region. It's Sham. It's, it's, yeah. you know, it's uh, Palestine, it's Jordan. part of Turkey and Jordan and so yeah. forth, Lebanon. Uh, so it has you know, connotations for the Muslim Ummah. Allah, you know, Prophet said, Allah mubarak lana fi shamina, that the signs of, of the last hour will take place in, in, if people want to believe all of the hadith that say that so many things will take place and Malhamat al Kubra, the, the great. Many, many things. Yeah, many things. Many things. So there's, there's the, been that attraction. Mm-hmm. The fact that uh, Baghdadi and his organization declared a caliphate and people went and there are tens of thousands, men, women, and children, of which we're still seeing in places like Baghouz and all yeah, the yeah. other the camps of the, the, the fallout of these poor women and children left over with nationalities revoked and yeah. living in the middle of the desert. Uh, all of that has happened. Syria has been this place that, where, as I said, all of the regional players and the non-regional players have taken part. Everybody's bombing everybody. And of course, you know for a fact, it doesn't matter who you do it to, the most peaceful people on the world, if you were to bomb them repeatedly for eight years, one side or the other, they are going to come out angry, upset, disorientated, traumatized. And of course, you won't be able to trust them. You won't know what you can do with them. So you'll say, well, let's just keep them to the side, keep them away from us. Mm. And they are a traumatized people and anything can happen out of that. So rather than trying to redress the trauma, trying to treat the trauma, you're just adding to it. Uh, And so 
nobody's come forward and said, actually, let these people not only have their own self-determination, we won't get involved in the war, but we'll simply defend. We won't let them strike from the skies. Have an, uh, you know, for example, having an, a, a no-fly zone, as they had in Bosnia, as they had in the Kurdish areas in Iraq and so forth. They can establish no-fly zones, they just don't want to. Hmm. So still, as we talk now, Idlib is getting bombed, either by Russia, by the Syrian regime, or the Americans. Hmm. Everybody bombs there, so how are the people going to be safe there? Uh, and, and it's... Uh, the world will be paying a price for it. I believe that ISIS now, though it's dead, uh, at least its leadership is, will rise not only again, will become even more extreme. And you can see this from what happened with Al-Qaeda. You can see what happened with the organization before. It's going to happen because it's going to be born out of blood and war. And anything that's born in that place won't come out with peace. Hmm. It will come out with what it's, what it's learnt, what it's been taught. Uh, and the world, again, once again, nobody's had that vision to, to recognize that we need to allow these people to be in peace on their own terms. And back to, uh, we digress to as mindful, back to, back to the, the advice, if we could give some advice to ulama, du'at, activists, those who are either choosing to remain silent, who actively comment and rightfully issue statements of condemnation when atrocities take place in Western countries like Christchurch or the Paris attacks and so forth. But on Syria, there's a deafening silence. Well, you see, the thing is now everybody's talking about, again, it's, it's, this, it's this irony. Baghdadi's been killed. Everybody's talking about ISIS. I condemn ISIS. I condemn ISIS. Okay, you can condemn ISIS till the cows come home. We've heard it. We're sick of it. We're bored of it. Yeah. Because everybody has. Yeah. There's nobody that hasn't. Yeah. But what of the people there in Syria? What have you, why have you backtracked? Uh, why don't you at least openly make dua for them in your masajid? Oh Allah, peace, uh, Allah support the people of Syria. Peace support the Mujahideen of Syria who are defending their last stronghold. Why can't you do that? Is it because you're afraid? It's and, fear. And, and how do you address the issue of fear? The only thing I can say is that is that uh, there's not one prophet that came except that he wasn't tested. Uh, tested with his people, with his family, with people from outside, from uh, from the tests of the, the most powerful. They were tested with life. Some were killed. Some were imprisoned. Some were tortured. Some received all of it. Some were separated from the families. We are an ummah that claims exclusively we are followers of the prophets. It's part of our iman. And if we keep saying that we're afraid, 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 then that means in what some sense, the fear that you're supposed to be attributing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively, you've now attributed to, uh, to, to mankind. To creation. So in my view, that, you know, an alim can tell you whether this is a form of shirk or not. In my view, it's a form of shirk. In my view, attributing that much fear to uh, a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or creation of Allah is an attribute uh, of shirk. Is it, how big it is or small it is, I can't tell you. But this constant notion of fear, the opposite is what? Cowardice. Hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu used to make a dua when he saw this man in, in, in the masjid and he saw he's so upset. He's very upset and sad. He said, Ya Allah Rasulullah, teach me something that can help me out of this. So he said, I'll teach you this dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min hammi wal hazm. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from sadness and sorrow. Yes. Wal ajzi wal kasr. And from laziness and, and, uh, and, and a, a, age. Wal bukhli wal jubal. And from being miserly and cowardly. Right. And from being taken over by, uh, by, by uh, um, debt and being uh, forced by people of, of power to be uh, subdued. This is a dua that was taught and our ulama teach this dua. But it is about time they applied it on themselves and started to say, listen, cowardice in the face of, of, of repeated attacks on Islam and Muslim people never got us anywhere. And you people will remember only your cowardice, nothing else. You won't be able to set any trend for the future, anything for our future uh, generations to look back. Because when we look back, who do we remember? Those who stood up, those who fought, those who sacrificed, those who paid a price. Who remembers those who sold out? Who remembers those who remained silent? Nobody remembers them. And if you're not remembered amongst the people of dunya for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how are you going to be remembered in the akhirah amongst the angels? 
On that note, we'll bring the podcast to a close. Uh, well, it was an absolute honor having you on, bro. And um, you know, the podcast usually ends with challenges, uh, but you're the first guest that I will offer no challenge to. <laughs> that's my that's my respect that I've afforded to you. It make it makes no sense uh, for someone who's gone through background in Guantanamo and Belmarsh for me to offer you an arm wrestle uh, yeah. or a thumb wall. And I did what well, I was going to offer you barn, but you're Pakistani. You know what barn is. <laughs> so consider this uh, a, a mark of my respect to you and my endearment for you, my brother. Allah barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa taala accept it for you. Amin ya rab. And make it a source of benefit for both of us. Inshallah. In the name of Allah. Amin ya rab. Amin ya rab. Brothers and sisters, that is all for today. Jazakallah khair for tuning in. Uh, for our viewers and uh, listeners from North America, subscribe to the Mad Mamluks channel where you can listen to this podcast on all the audio platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google, Apple Podcasts. For the UK people and those in Europe, subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. Uh, leave a comment. It doesn't even have to be a positive comment. Just leave a comment, like the video and give us your feedback, inshallah. And until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Burma's podcast. Five Pillars of Mad Monarchs Production. <laughs>